Good evening. Welcome. We're so glad you're here tonight. Our final study, final chapter of 2 Thessalonians. See, we got through it and, and we're going to finish it up, Lord willing, tonight and uh, see where the Lord will take us. You know, it's been an incredible journey on this and how the Lord's taking care of his people, warning us, protecting us. And well, tonight's going to be no different. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray you would help us to understand your word. Father, we need your help tonight. Father, we want to be able to, to see your glory. So help us, we pray, as we study this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. If you remember, Paul had been taking the idea of, of bringing the uh, Thessalonians through, saying God will take care of you. But you're not in the end times. You're, the Antichrist hasn't come, and he gave more information about the Antichrist and how God protects us. So now he's beginning to wrap up, as he normally does in his letters, but gives some very good um, establishing of, of the work of church life. You know, there's so many ideas out there of what the church should be doing, how the church should be doing it, and there's no better way to look at it than when the gospel is presented. So the gospel is presented in this way, and it says in verse 1 of chapter 3 of 2 Thessalonians, you there? All right, it says, finally, brethren, Pray for us. Now, he's saying pray. Why? Here's the why. I just, I just pray to pray. That the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you. I love that. That the word of the Lord may run swiftly. You know, one of the things I think about when I hear the word run swiftly is, is deer. There's, there's many deer in the, the backyard of the church of the parsonage that, that you provide for my family and I to stay in. And we see deer all the time. And then when they see us coming, um, it's interesting. They run. They run. And, and they just go. And I see how quick they go, especially, unfortunately, when they cross streets. Very dangerous, of course. But you see them run. That's what Paul is saying. Is, is run, let it run swiftly. Let it, let it just go out. Let it go and pray that it is. But just like there are those that want to hunt deer, there are those that want to hunt the gospel. And they want to stop the gospel from being presented. So that's why Paul is saying the way to combat it is through prayer. Pray that, that the gospel may run swiftly, go out through all of the nation, and history shows that that prayer is answered and being answered, and that it would be glorified, just as it is with you, that, that the, 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 the hope that you've found in Christ, Thessalonians, let others find it. And I would say this, the hope that you have found full gospel in Christ, let others find it. What a key idea that we have for that. And it says to verse 2, and continues the thought, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. Again, there's the idea. Your prayer is that the gospel would run swiftly and that it would protect the leaders, the presenters of the gospel. That's not just the pastor or, or Miss Mary or Pastor Jamie. It, it's anybody that would present the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it says that the people that, that may prevent it are, Paul calls them unreasonable, and they're wicked. They want this gospel stopped. There are people, and they'll say, well, we don't care. No, there are people out there that want the gospel stopped. They believe the gospel is, is anti of everything they think, and they are going to do whatever they can in their power. Now, I'm not just talking about the great government leaders. I'm not talking about, you know, um, those in high pay places, although we have plenty of those that do want this gospel stop. I'm talking about people that live right near you. I'm talking about family members. I'm talking about the ones that say, don't, I don't want to hear about Jesus, and don't you ever preach it again to my family. The Bible said, now again, when, when you go into wicked, I, I have to have you remember something. That the Bible says that when we're born into this world, because we are all covered with sin, we're all wicked. Okay? We are wicked in a sense that evil has covered over us. Um, we may not be the devil incarnate, but we are people that, that go against the plan of God. Okay? That's important. We are saved 
from sin and from death, but we're, we're sanctified, set apart. Remember we talked about that? That salvation through sanctification, we're set apart from that. We need more people to do that. So continuing on to verse number three, friends, it says, but the Lord is faithful. <laughs> we may not be, but the Lord is faithful. Hallelujah. Who will establish you and will guard you from the evil one. Now that is Christians, again, I, I think it's so important. I, I have heard and, and grown up and people saying that, well, you know, well, Christians, they better watch out because the devil can possess them. To, no. In fact, the Bible tells us when we come to Christ, we put on the armor of God. There is a protection that God automatically puts on from Satan. Now, I, I, the the commentator, one of the commentators I read used it in this way. He said that God promised to keep Satan on a leash when it comes to the people of God, when it comes to those who have committed their life to Christ. And I think of two verses. Paul, when he wrote to Corinthians in verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, he said, no, sub no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. That's very simple. They, they, there's there's temptations. Everybody deals with them. He says, but God is faithful. There's the line again. Not man is faithful. God is faithful. Now, this is the key. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. I, I can't stress that enough with you. Understand that when we have a reality of who God is. Okay? When we come to Christ, Satan is going to continue to oversee us. He's going to try to, to take us back. He's going to try to ruin us. But by God says that any temptation that comes, I'm going to make this escape hatch. And it's up to you to take the escape hatch. So see, Satan cannot just force that temptation on us. We have to agree to go through it. The other verse that is interesting is in Luke chapter 22. When the Lord says to, to Simon, he goes, uh, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you. Wow. Satan is asked. Who's he asked? He's asked God. That he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your Brethren, Satan will has to get the permission of God in order for us to have any involvement or anything with him. It says, he says he, he was ready to, to, to take Peter apart. But Jesus said, no, because I asked the Lord to prevent that. And that is a, a, a wonderful prayer that we should pray for our Christian brothers and sisters. For me, you should pray that for, for my life, for Mary's life, for Pastor Jamie's life, for, for any in leadership. That, that God would, would, would take us and say, no, no, I, I, I'm praying God that Satan would not uh, put any type of hindrance in their life that would stop them. So you see, there's a key here that Satan, his prevention, we, we, we think Satan is just is running amok Again, I, I said it last week, it, it bears repeating. God has everything under control. We may not understand the plan the way he's bringing it, but God is in control. And then in verse 5, it says, Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and the patience of Christ. <laughs> the love and patience, two of the key areas we need in order to deal with relationships. Love and patience. Love is not enough. We, we go there and, and, and I'll be performing a wedding in a couple of days and I'll be uniting two people who love each other. But one of the keys I'm going to remind them of, it's not just love, it's patience. Love and patience establishes. And that's what God wants our hearts to be directed in. Love and patience. Now Paul begins to shift a little bit in, in dealing with the, the Thessalonian church. And he talks about the, the problem with idleness. Now, let, let's establish what some commentators um, have kind of surmised. Uh, because of this idea of the day of the Lord, 
because of this idea that Jesus had returned and 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 you know everything was happening, um, there were some who probably had just said, "Well, why am I doing everything if the Lord already returned? What what's the use?" And they kind of gave up. And and Paul gives an incredible um, word of encouragement to Thessalonians that we need to take in for today's society. Verse 6, But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw, withdraw, now, now follow this, withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. Withdraw. That that's a, a, a very important word. It's to to get away from, to 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 move away. When you withdraw an offer uh, on a house, you put a bid in, but you withdraw it. You're saying that offer, that that thing. I, I don't want to have anything to do with that. I have to remove myself from that. That is not true anymore. That's what Paul is saying to the believer. I can't stress this. Not the non-Christian. Not to the one who who doesn't follow God. The one who follows God. That one who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition or the teachings that he has received from us. Now, withdraw, the key phrase is, is, is walks disorderly. Walks. We're not talking about somebody that has an issue. And if they had a situation, if they had a falling, they said, well, because you fell, I want nothing to do with you. Actually, the Bible doesn't tell us to withdraw from that person. It says that we are to help and assist the weaker brother. Sometimes in the church, we, we kind of mess that up. And someone that's fallen, be it through a moral failure failure or an economic failure or something, uh, we think, well, God doesn't want me to be with you. It's not what the Word of God says. You can believe it, but that's not what the Word of God says. It says that weaker brother, because that's the only thing that brings that in, is weakness. Uh, it says... To, to help them. No, this is someone who is is knows the truth, but is ignoring the truth and has a pattern walking. And you've had conversation and you've had encouragement and you've tried to talk to them and they still say, no, 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 I, I don't want that. I don't want that. Paul says, all right, for your sake, believer, withdraw from them. Go away. Don't, don't, I'm not saying ignore and shun. Don't don't but but don't have relationship where it could draw you into their path. Verse 7. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you. Now he gets to the crux of this. Again, we mentioned just before that some had given up the idea they were just going to give up. And here's the problem. Verse 8. It says, Nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. Now he gets into the idea of saying, here's the example we want you to do. We want you to work. Now, this brings in a whole idea of, of um, you know, providing for the needy, caring. Um, we, we've heard in our uh, political and economic side about income inequality and, and gender inequality and all these things And when it comes to work. All right, and we're not going to debate those issues here tonight. We're going to stay with what the Word of God says. However, the Bible is very clear that people need to work. And I know there is a remnant that probably would be very happy not to do anything. I get that, okay? But I, I'll just say in the circles of the people that I associate with, I've commented to, been with, yes, there's a work. The, the problem is, you know, it, it's what you're doing it for. You know, the reason. Here in America, praise the Lord, we have a society right now that that you can work your say, way up a ladder. We, we pray that continues. You can work your way up to where you're in the mail room of a business and then you can become a vice president uh, of a corporation. I'll just use that idea. You could be uh, flipping hamburgers um, and then go to a place where you can manage that store. Um, listen, 
the point that Paul is making is there's a problem when you're not working. There's a problem when you're idle because then the mind doesn't focus. Some people have, have said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, when I have a problem, I'm going to drown myself in my work. So my mind isn't thinking about every other thing. And I, I get the idea of that. And Paul's kind of saying, do not let your mind be idle. Because then he goes to verse 10. Now, follows on verse 10. It says, for even when we were with you, we commanded you this. If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Okay. That was Paul's command. His saying that he believes that, that if you're going to, eat food, you're going to work for that food instead of somebody just bringing it to you, instead of somebody just preparing it and you don't do a thing. He says that becomes a problem when you don't have that mindset. And again, it's a biblical mindset, not just because of Paul bringing it, but all the way through. Uh, Jesus taught about working and, 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 and not being idle, it, keeping your mind focused on things above. And verse 11 says, For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner. That's this idea of, of, of ignoring the teachings and not working and, and, and being a problem. And it says, not working at all, but they are busybodies. Do you know what a busybody is? Huh? Do you know what a busybody is? There's a great synonym for, for a busybody. It's called a meddler. Meddler. Someone who puts themselves in a situation because they don't want to deal with their own, so they'll, they'll be involved in someone else's issue. And he says that that's a problem. It is that especially those who ignore the teachings of God. Why do we know that? Because of the book of Matthew. Remember, Jesus made it very clear, hey, listen, before you take that little moat out of their eye, you take care of the log that's in your own. you got to concern yourself with things. And, and, and others, don't throw your two cents in because what that leads to is if there's a problem here, eventually it leads to gossip. Gossipers, the Bible makes it clear, will not see the kingdom of God. I'm not saying with someone that gossips once in a while. I'm talking about someone who has a lifestyle, who, they're, who don't care about what God says. Well, I'm going to do this anyway. It, there's a problem. And it leads to all different areas. And it brings down the body of Christ. It brings down the church. And then they're ineffect, ineffective. And verse 12 says, And not those who are such we command and we exhort that they work in quietness and they eat their own bread. In other words, stop being a busybody. Stop it. S just stop it. Well, I want to stop it. Well, it's going to stop it. That's what Paul is saying. Those are such we command and exhort through Jesus. Work in quietness. Do your work. Do what you have to. And eat your own bread. Don't keep trying to get, get your own self together. Keep within. If you're, it, the better thing to do is if you're going to cause an issue and you're going to express your opinion, then the better thing to do is to keep yourself away from that because it won't bring any glory to God. And then he continues on that thought by saying a very famous verse, for as for you, verse 13, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. Uh, Paul knew what he was saying because that's a tough thing. It is tough. Verse 14, and if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, now, this, again, this is to a believer. Note that person. Okay, Understand who that is. Know who it is. Don't guess. And do not keep company with him. Why? That he may, may be ashamed. All right? When you begin to withdraw, all right? When, you, when, you be, when they're talking and talking and talking, when they say, hey, let's go out to eat. And you know that person, all they're going to do is gossip. All they're going to do is complain. All they're going to do it. Then it's probably better to say, no, no, I don't think so. Why? Because it says they'll be ashamed. Maybe they'll say, well, what did I do wrong? Well, maybe the Lord will convict them. I hope he will. And verse 15 says this, and this is so important. But don't count him as an enemy. We talked about that before with the weaker brother. But admonish him as a brother. We're not to excommunicate people from our church, our lives, um, in a sense, because they, they are busybodies. They need to be corrected. They need to be told, hey, you're gossiping. Hey, your conversation. Hey, your thought. It's wrong. Let's, let's change the subject. Do that real quick. 
Because what's going to happen is, is they're either going to be angry or, or they're going to be uh, ashamed. One or two is going to happen. And if they do, the Bible says, let them be ashamed. So that's the right thing. So there's a key here. Idleness brings about so many problems. That's why keep yourself busy. Uh, that's why when, when you're, if you're not in the services, um, listen to the Word of God. Hopefully through me, other people. Again, get the Word of God in your life. All right, you're, you're going to be hearing so much more. We're, we're just a few days from an election. You're going to be hearing more rhetoric and more rhetoric. And God says, keep your mind on things above. And one of the things to do is to pray. Pray for this nation. Pray that, that all these predictions of a split and a civil war and all that, that, that goes away and that God brings this nation back together. The last moment I have with you is Paul's ending. Verse 16, now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. Oh, pray God would give us peace. That's what we should be praying for. Peace of God. And the salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle I write. He's saying this is genuine. And the grace of our Lord, Jesus Christ, be with you all. Amen. So Paul is making sure that this church understands, no, you didn't miss the day of the Lord. No, the rapture did not hit. And you've got work to do. So they waited with that anticipation. When it was going to happen, we're still waiting. But God's timing is perfect. But again, and I mentioned this on Sunday. I'm going to mention it again. Um, the, the events that happened in Sudan and Israel, coming together, uh, relations and, and rec Sudan recognizing. Once again, you look at it just in the political landscape, you are missing, you're missing, you're missing what God is doing. That God is setting up this entire world for this end time scenario. It is, it's now becoming just, just more and more obvious when you open your eyes to it. Keep your eyes open. Keep your eyes focused on things above and what God's going to do. We'll give you word through our email and, and texting and all that about our new study starting next week as we prepare for our Thanksgiving season and, of course, the Christmas season. So a lot going on. Um, enjoy the night. And we pray God's blessings on you.